this is Linda Smetzlar. I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. And this morning I am joined uh, by Dr. Penny Chris Etherton. She is the Distinguished Professor of Nutrition in the Department of Nutritional Sciences in the College of Health and Human Development at Penn State University. And our topic this morning is the role of dietary fats in cardiovascular and other diseases. Welcome, Dr. Chris Etherton. Thank you, Linda. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to start with um, our first question, and it is what are your thoughts on how we use dietary treatments today versus in the past? I know I spent many years working in the area of dietary fatty acids and how they affect cardiovascular disease, and so would love to hear what your thoughts are on what we're doing today versus what we did in the past. Yes, well, there's been a huge transition from going from specific nutrients now to food-based dietary patterns, and uh, in the past we were so focused on specific nutrients and now, I think as everybody is well aware, the emphasis is on healthy dietary patterns. And most notably, uh, the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans have recommended three healthy uh, food-based dietary patterns. But I think um, there are a lot of other recommendations made by other organizations that have uh, followed along with these uh, specific uh, guidelines, and in particular, uh, American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology have made um, lifestyle guidelines that focus on healthy dietary patterns to reduce LDL cholesterol and blood pressure. National Lipid Association has done so as well. And then uh, Dr. Linda Van Horn has published a paper in circulation on healthy dietary patterns and the specifics of them. Uh, to meet different cultural, ethnic needs that also um, address, you know, current dietary recommendations. So I think, though, we have to also keep in mind that, you know, with these specific food-based patterns uh, embedded in them are specific recommendations still for saturated fatty acids, sodium, and added sugars. And the next slide, you see um, these specific food-based dietary recommendations made by the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans for a healthy U.S.-style eating pattern based on different calorie needs. And, um, you know, this, these recommendations make it so easy, I think, for practitioners to teach people about healthy eating and also for individuals to understand how to follow a healthy dietary pattern. I know, too, that in the past we probably looked at coconut oil in, in a very different way. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering today what the story around coconut oil is and certainly what some of your thoughts are about type of fat as um, registered dietitian nutritionists work with dietary planning. Yes. Well, both consumers as well as many health professionals have heard that coconut oil is a good fat, and they've heard that it's good for heart health, and they've heard that it's good from, for body weight control, and then also for brain health. But I think delving into the literature tells a little different story here. Um, you know, what they've heard is, you know, um, a lot of media hype and claims made on you know, on Google. Uh, so for body weight, the evidence comes mainly from MCT studies that have shown a benefit. And, you know, basically all of the, you know, Alzheimer's research is word of mouth, although there is some that's just starting to evolve right now. But for the most part, we really don't have a strong evidence base showing health benefits for coconut oil. I think that, um, you know, one of the areas that uh, has received a lot of attention is, you know, the what is the effect of coconut oil on lipids and lipoproteins? 
And there have been a few studies. Um, I like people to know about uh, systematic review and meta-analysis published in 2016 that reviewed eight clinical trials and 13 observational studies. Now, that's not a lot. Um, and basically, you know, the authors found that replacing coconut oil with unsaturated fats would decrease blood lipids consistent with a reduction in CVD risk factors. Well, that's our current dietary recommendation, isn't it? Um, replace coconut oil with unsaturated fat. And overall, the review didn't support popular claims that coconut oil is a healthy oil to reduce CVD risk. Well, since this review came out, I have found three other articles in the literature, and these are kind of interesting because they're looking at either extra virgin coconut oil or virgin coconut oil. And so as you see on this slide, the three papers were published between 2017 and 2018. Uh, one was done in the United Kingdom, one done in the United States, and one was done in Thailand. And uh, basically, there's mixed evidence here. And so that two studies, uh, the one done by Ka and the one done by Ching um basically you know, reported no increase in LDL cholesterol with extra virgin coconut oil. Um, but the one done in the United States, albeit on a small number of subjects, uh, an N of 12, did show that LDL increased with the virgin coconut oil compared to safflower oil. So I, I think, um, you know, right now we need to just await a lot of further evidence before we can, you know, tell people, oh, coconut oil is okay or virgin coconut oil is okay because, um, you know, the the Evidence really is mixed right now, and I think the the best thing that we can do is follow current dietary recommendations, and they basically say, you know, that we really should limit coconut oil. You know, a lot of people have equated coconut oil research with medium chain triglyceride research, and um, coconut oil can't be assumed to have the same benefits as MCTs because it contains primarily lauric acid, that's C12, rather than the shorter chain MCTs. And also, it doesn't have 100% MCTs. There are some long chain saturated fatty acids in coconut oil. And so only about 58% of total fatty acids in coconut oil of MCTs, of which 44% comes from lauric acid. And there's a lot of debate about whether lauric acid is even an MCT. Um, some people feel that it really should be categorized as a long chain saturated fatty acid because 70 to 75 percent of it is absorbed with chylomicrons. So I think um, we really have to be careful about the coconut oil research, even the virgin coconut oil research, and follow current recommendations to substitute liquid vegetable oils in place of fats that are solid at room temperature, and that's coconut oil. Thank you. Very, very, very nice summary. I also know that there's some controversy around the whole concept of polyunsaturated fatty acids, and, and this is particularly true when we look at uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids in relationship to cancer. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on our message um, to clients, patients, uh, what that message should be in regard to polyunsaturated fatty acids. Sure. I, I think the best message is follow current dietary guidelines and recommendations from authoritative organizations about polyunsaturated fatty acids. But let's kind of dig down into the details here. And I found one paper which I thought was really good, um, and then others as well, to kind of put all this in perspective. Indeed, there is some evidence from animal models that linoleic acid can act as a tumor promotant, especially under some conditions. But in general, human studies don't consistently implicate linoleic acid in the development of cancer. 
um, you know, there is some mixed evidence, some reports concluding no association, some concluding that there is, in fact, an adverse association, and some even a beneficial association. And so what this uh, Jandacek has said is that, you know, we really should be studying this further. But I think, let's look at the big picture here. And, you know, I think a more important message, rather than splitting hairs about linoleic acid and being so focused on that, is to pay attention to dietary, dietary recommendations for cancer prevention from authoritative organizations, one of which the American, is the American Institute for Cancer Research. And you can see what they're recommending here. Uh, be as lean as possible, be physically active, avoid sugary drinks, eat more vegetables, fruits, whole grains and legumes, limit consumption of red meats, and also totally avoid processed meats, uh, moderate alcohol consumption, limit consumption of salty foods, processed and foods processed with salt, and don't use supplements to protect against cancer. Mothers should breastfeed, and after treatment, cancer survivors should definitely follow recommendations for cancer prevention. And so that's the message that we should be given. Um, but, you know, we really should pay attention to all the research here. And um, let's look at it, because I think this is a topic that continually comes up. So if we look at um, a review and a meta-analysis study that was done by Zak and Katan way back in 1998, because that's when this topic, you know, was really under a lot of scrutiny. You can see that for breast cancer, for colon cancer, and prostate cancer, there's really not an association with linoleic acid, high versus low, and these types of cancers. And so the authors way back then said it seems unlikely that a high intake of linoleic acid substantially raises the risk of breast, colorectal, and prostate cancer in humans. So fast forward now to 2017, and uh, this topic has been reviewed again. And so that uh, there's a lot of text on this slide. Uh, this is the abstract that comes from a presidential advisory at American Heart Association on dietary fats and cardiovascular disease, but it does cover the topic of cancer. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But I underlined what the take-home message here is, and that is taking into consideration the totality of scientific evidence satisfying rigorous criteria for causality, we conclude strongly that lowering intake of saturated fat and replacing it with unsaturated fats, especially polyunsaturated fats, will lower the incidence of CVD. Now, if there was a any hint that polys you know, would lower CVD but increase risk of cancer, this recommendation never would have been made. And in fact, in this paper, there's a wonderful figure that looks at substituting polys for saturated fats on total mortality. And what I think is interesting is, you know, let's look at polys and then look at monos and trans fats as well. But you see consistent evidence for polys um, that when they're substituted for saturated fat, total mortality decreases, cardiovascular disease mortality decreases, cancer mortality decreases. And you can see that uh, the CIs don't cross one there. Neurodegenerative disease mortality decreases and respiratory disease mortality decreases. So I think we have really good recent evidence that Polyunsaturated fats are really not associated with cancer and, in fact, may, in fact, benefit cancer mortality and mortality from other diseases. Um, I like looking at in review of nutrition, and there's a great article um, by Frank Hu and his colleague Don Wang on dietary fat and risk of cardiovascular diseases, and they looked at N6 polys and the relationship with inflammatory biomarkers. And they looked at a lot of different studies. This is a great paper uh, because it's very comprehensive. And you can see here that higher intake of 
N6 polys, mainly linoleic acid, it wasn't associated with inflammatory biomarkers. And you can see the whole list there. So um, there's really not evidence that N6 polys are pro-inflammatory. And we have some evidence of that too, but because time doesn't permit, I won't go into that today. But, um, you know, I, I think it's important to bring bring up, you know, some very, very recent evidence. Um, now, on this slide, it's very consistent that um, total fat intake, including higher linoleic acid intake, isn't associated with, you know, a higher incidence of breast cancer. And you can see the first study in 2014. And then the second one reported in 2017. Uh, 15 prospective cohort studies looked at total fat and or saturated fat on breast cancer mortality. And uh, basically, the authors concluded that it wasn't total fat, but saturated fat uh, was associated with um, breast cancer mortality uh, in terms of this very large meta-analysis. Now, I said that I would talk about everything here. On the flip side of this, and Linda, I know that you were PI on WHI, uh, this study, you know, just came out uh, looking at breast cancer and total fat. And it's kind of interesting because during the 8.5-year 8, 8 intervention, um, there were fewer deaths from breast cancer in the dietary group. That's a lower fat group, but that wasn't statistically significant. But then during the same period, deaths after breast cancer were significantly reduced uh, in the dietary intervention, the low-fat group. Now, what I think is really interesting from this paper is that there was a 16.1-year follow-up, and you can see that there are over 3,000 incident breast cancer cases. Deaths after breast cancer were significantly reduced in the dietary group. Now, this isn't linoleic acid but it's total fat, and that's a composite of everything. Maybe it was a saturated fat. Uh, who knows? But this is kind of interesting. We have some evidence here that compared with a usual diet, a low-fat dietary pattern did lead to a lower incidence of death after diagnosis of breast cancer. Penny, thank you so much. That was um, a lovely summary of what we know about total fat. Um, and, and certainly, I, I love the fact that you've really delved into the evidence base of the whole concept of total fat. Thank you. And then a final question is, what should the bottom line be on dietary fat as we work with patient populations? This is something that I think is uh, very interesting to the Academy membership and certainly those who are working with clients and patients, your ideas here will be, I think, very important to the work that they do. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, we are obliged as registered dietitians to follow current dietary recommendations from authoritative organizations. And I think, you know, we have the latest, the 2015-2020 Dietary Guidelines from Americans. And, um, you know, esteemed scientists were responsible for gathering all the evidence that led to the development of these dietary guidelines. And you can see a healthy U.S.-style eating pattern recommends around 27 grams per day of liquid vegetable oils. And that's in the context of a diet that meets food-based recommendations that are all low in total fat. And so the fat that is in this particular dietary pattern does come from mainly from unsaturated fats that are uh, derived principally from liquid vegetable oils. And I think, you know, this slide, which um, is adapted from Dr. Darius Mosaferian's slide, sums it all up. And uh, we have good fats and fats that should be limited. And so um, 
we want to recommend good fats in the context of a healthy dietary pattern. Um, and they should come from marine omega-3 fats, and you can see some examples listed, salmon, other fatty fish, plant omega-6 fats from corn, soybeans, safflower, sunflower oils, uh, plant omega-3 fats from walnuts, canola oil, flax seeds, and monounsaturated fats that come from olive oil, uh, peanut oil. We have a lot of high mono oils in the marketplace now. Um, nuts and avocados are examples of good fats that we want to recommend. And then we want to limit saturated fats, and these mainly come from animal fats and then uh, tropical oils, um, including coconut oil, palm oil, and palm kernel oil. And then we really do want to eliminate industrial trans fatty acids that come mainly from partially hydrogenated oils. And then in closing, I just want everybody to know about what I think is a great American Heart Association resource. It's entitled Dietary Fats and Fatty Acids in Cardiovascular Disease. And um, it was actually featured and launched at FENCI 2017 meeting. Uh, so some of our members may be familiar with it. And you can see how you can access this online. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Chris Featherton. Um, I also want to say uh, a thank you for all of the research that you've done over the years in the area of dietary fats and, and all of the articles that um, you have provided to help us look at the evidence behind dietary fats and chronic disease. Also, many thanks today for the summaries that you've provided. I, I think they are making a clear uh, message for registered dietitian nutritionists in terms of what they might say um, to their patients, to their clients, which is so important. And thank you again. Oh, you're welcome. It's been my pleasure.